Thank you, Jack, and thank you very much for the previous speakers. It's going to really shorten my talk even further because uh, <laughs> some of the stuff captured by Peter, reinforced by Nari, and then beautifully brought together by Lutgard, especially in relation to relationships between canopy and increased through, uh, through fall. I mean, there's the, the downstream impacts of that increased through fall. What are the consequences for these catchment areas? Is there an, is that increased uh, solubilisation? Is, uh, is there going to be a deterioration of that water uh, water system? So these important downstream questions, because kauri, mehe kauri, whakaruu hau, katoro nā peka, he afe i te wau. Like the branches of the kauri, we stretch out uh, our arms to embrace the environment. And we also need to embrace the past. I'd like to just uh, start off my talk by recognising those that have come before us. Um, we've already mentioned the late, great Matua Ross Ewan Beaver, who passed in 2010. But fortunately, we've also uh, lost another couple of key researchers here who've been ably replaced by Peter, Nari and Rebecca. But Margaret Dick retired last year and uh, Margaret together with Ross have been working on Phytophthoras for a very long time. I don't want to say how long, because I don't want to embarrass Margaret. <laughs> but another young gentleman, Todd Bramsfield, uh, returned to Canada. And Todd was a molecular forest pathologist who um, gave us our first insights into the story, the interesting story around Phytophthora canovio. And um, I think it's been said that you know, if, we, if we've been able to see further than others, it's because we're still on the shoulders of giants. And I think yeah, the opportunities that uh, I have had, I know personally, um, would not be here without Ross because, um, well, he hired me, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Peter captured this for you. Uh, we just wanted to refine it a little. Um, Phytophthora is not a fungus. Phytophthora is a chromist and a potentially a relative of the brown algae, or brown algas. And so, interestingly, we're dealing with a cellulose cell wall. Um, the refinement of the life cycle, as we've gone through our studies looking at the biology of PTA, we, we rarely see chlamydia spores in culture. So we want to emphasise here that these are experiments being undertaken in pure culture. And we also know that it's homothallic, being able to produce oospores in a single culture. And so we've removed this, the, the other option of heterothal. Um, as Peter suggested, that there's uh, an ability to uh, handle or manage extremes of environment. And in uh, drought conditions, potentially, uh, they can estivate, remain for a long time in the, in the system as thick-walled, dormant oospores, but provide free water in the soil solution and we have a transformation of the organism through from our spores germinating to produce sporangia and then that beautiful elegant slide that Nari showed with appropriate conditions the sporangia, germ, uh, sporangia internally proliferate these motile zoospores which have two flagella which can even um, which, which say tinsel in the light as you're looking them under a microscope and they can swim to uh, infect other roots. But at each of these stages, there are environmental conditions which control that infectivity. And it's those environmental conditions that Lutgard so eloquent, eloquently identified vary between individual to individual that makes it very hard to generalise. And this is wrapped up very, very nicely in this, um, in this triangle. The, the, this is, an, this is a, um, a bit of an advancement of the fundamental disease triangle, but at the top of the of the of the, bird, uh, of the triangle is the host. Along the uh, along this axis is environment, and the bottom of this axis is the presence of the pathogen. This is adapted from a uh, Nature Review in and around microbes and human health, but I think it also lends itself nicely to our interpretation of what some of the vari uh, variability we've seen in some of the impacts within some of these infested sites. Because as young master Nick pointed out, impacts are observed across the age classes. But as Nari pointed out, um, we really are quite unsure about when the introductions occurred. And for a number of these pathogens, 
there is a requirement for a building up of the, of the inoculum to a critical threshold by which inf infection can be precipitated. So we've got the biology of the pathogen. The biology of the pathogen, it is living in the soil solution. And so the, the sorts of environmental uh, variation that uh, Lutgard alluded to, wet summers, dry summers, dry winters, wet winters, extended winters, these variations that occur, especially within the Auckland area, because we've got a very strongly influenced coastal maritime climate, where we can have, we can have rainfall distributed throughout the year. But it can also be accentuated in summer, in summer events, or it can be removed from summer events. The influence of environment challenges the host, because the host just can't get up and move like an animal. It is stuck there. And I've got a lot of respect for trees, because they really have to make do with where they are standing. But they do not stand alone. And Nick's comments around the mycorrhiza that inhabit nodules on this cowrie show that it is that is it has developed in partnership with other organisms, and so too any of our management uh, interventions need to take into consideration the biology and ecology of these other associates, and ultimately the uh, the severity of the environment, which could predispose a host to disease, uh, the presence of a virulence pathogen they come together in this perfect storm, which is the disease expression. And the disease expression, um, <coughs> potentially as a fine root infection, <coughs> progressing to the collar where it parasitizes the secondary cambium. This disrupts the um, phloem resin cells which lie adjacent to that secondary cambium, and then the resin moves radially. We get this characteristic resinosis, um, because it is indeed a resin, but we comfortably call it gumosis, but of course we know that gum is water soluble and resin is not indeed liquid soluble. At these, um, the little leafing stage that I looked at a point to, which potentially could allow increased through fall, reduce the amount of stem flow because the uh, interception has been reduced. This has consequences for uh, uh, the water, uh, the, the water availability for other species living below Cali. And um, it's been reinforced for us today that PTA is soil born. And this infection can be spread through the movement of infested soil. There's a really wonderful poster I'd like you to look out there. It just happens to be done by uh, Alvina, who was a, summer, uh, a high school summer student of ours, where she basically took her friends through for a walk in the Waitakere's and basically took the soil off their boots. And from less than six grams of soil, we were able to recover Phytophthora. And how do we do it? We take advantage of this, of this amazing ability that when you add water, it changes its biology. We take advantage of its unique biology to fish out the Phytophthora from the, from the soil. And the hypothesis is, the approximate hypothesis is that there are long-lived structures that are in that soil that are activated through the flooding to give rise to, the, uh, to us to be able to capture the organism. And indeed, as Nari showed, and as some of the work, elegant work from Margaret Dick, that other spores can, can germinate and produce sporangia. And that these sporangia, once they have completed their internal proliferation, can release the zoospores out. And we capture those zoospores. We capture those zoospores on artificial plant baits. And here's an example of a plant bait. Actually, Ross took this photo using me as the hand model. I always thought that I have a, wouldn't have an opportunity as a hand in modelling. But obviously, if I focused on my hands, then I might have a future. Um, great place for radio. Uh, we just don't just deal with this on a very simple media, but because we take advantage of the fact that it's a chromist. So we can actually grow it in the presence of fungicide. You're going to say, well, how can you do that? Well, it's got a cellulose wall. So, I mean, the fungicides are geared towards killing funguses. This is not a fungus. So we can inhibit the other uh, potential bycatchers that are on that bait. We can inhibit the pythium with homexazole, we can inhibit the bacteria with a couple of bactericides, and we can inhibit the fungi as well. And then, if we're lucky, because it is a probabilistic indirect assay, we can get an outgrowth of PTA. Notice, um, and this technique was provided to us by uh, the late Caleb Francis Hill, who together with his partner in crime, Mike Dance and Frank Newhook in 1972 developed this soil bioassay. But uh, Frank's, com uh, Frank's suggestion to us was to make sure you plate out that <coughs> pedestal. 
because his feeling was that was a critical piece in, in to be able to capture the organism. And um, yeah, that's something about institutional knowledge and just years and years of experience, he has proven true. We then take that organism, plate it to a clean plate of FPDA and confirm its identity by sequencing a particular part of its genome, which has now become the, the, uh, the barcode for fungi. But people have sort of alluded to how the disease is transferred. And we went about trying to test this experimentally. We created, we uh, uh, deliberately infected cowrie seedlings. And before they died, we pulled apart the plants and fractionated the roots into various fractions. We then grew some seedlings in these root books and we placed the infected root pieces on to the young cowrie seedlings in an effort not to disturb the roots but just to allow a natural transfer. Most importantly, we saw that PTA was transferred to the seedlings, the seedlings died and Cox postulates were confirmed by us being able to recover the, fun, uh, the, 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 the inoculant after the, after the experiment. And then people have also led to the fact that oospores are released into soil. But the, the, the fascinating nature of the biology and life history of Phytophthora is that they are hemibiotrophic. But once the plant tissue has died, they move into a, a phase of necrotrophy. And what we observed in the dead tissues of these deliberately infected roots were these beautiful oospores of PTA. So now, the, the knowledge we have about oospores is that in, in, in produced in vitro, they're approximately 80% produced are dormant. So they're, they're, they're living entities, and the majority that are produced are in dormant, are dormant. But these, that dormancy that is, uh, can be broken and, and, and triggered into activity. We do not know about the, uh, the status of these oospores. This was quite a, a fascinating discovery. But, it also, but what it provides for us is an insight into just how well protected this inoculum can be in soil because it's actually housed in an infected root piece. And so there'd be a series of processes which would break down that root material and then potentially release these pathogens or could there be direct germination from this material outwardly. And that would be the next step. Um, uh, th that cannot be tested from this particular material because we've cleared and stained and fixed this material. So these particular oospores are dead. But now that the fact that we've observed them, we can start being able to understand their biology in planter and understanding their role as a way to transfer and perpetuate PTA infection within a disease forest. The pioneering work of Ross um, was to identify that PTA was not um, Phytophthora herbae, which was, which was what it was identified back in 1971. And, there's, and it's fascinating because it is closely related to Phytophthora herbae. What Ross did identify was that PTA belongs to clade 5, the ITS clade 5 of the Phytophthora genus. And uh, so it belongs in that clade with Phytophthora katsuri and Phytophthora herbae. Pennycook um, identified that katsuri was a superfluous homonym and returned to Phytophthora castaneae. Phytophthora castaneae is, uh, has a host range of uh, castanopsis. Uh, castania, chestnut, of, uh, related from the phagaceae. Phytophthora herbae, of heavier, um, from uh, rubber, but also from avocado. Both Phytophthora herbae and Phytophthora catsurae <laughs> also occur in New Zealand, uh, also occur in Australia. When Ross did his work on the PTA, he found that it was a 100% match to Phytophthora castanea from Taiwan. But there was an issue in relation to the morphology. And so what we really needed was a multigen analysis to separate these differences. And Bevan, Simon Weir, together with Peter R. Johnston and Sean Pennycook and a range of other molecular biologists have been working over the last two and a half years to interrogate a range of genomic and mitochondrial loci to provide a more robust and rigorous phylogenetic analysis utilising both genomic and mitochondrial loci. And this is the resolution of uh, the efforts. 
what was two species within clade five is now four species in clade five. We retain Phytophthora castanei, we can see its host range and its potential geographic distribution. We also conserve Phytophthora herbae, noticing its host range, uh, which includes some exotic hosts and also its in in increased exotic range. We can look at the morphology of the Oligonia, the very smooth Oligonia of Phytophthora herbae, the very rugose or bullate uh, Oligonia of Phytophthora castanea. And the two new entities that emerge from within clade 5 is one associated with coconut, Phytophthora cocos, and then the one associated with Agathus, Phytophthora agathidisum. And yeah, smooth or rough. Um, some of the, some of the, I've looked at some of the early correspondence of Ian Horner when he was uh, corresponding with Ross around this other variant that existed between Castaneae and Herbae. But within this particular morphous, uh, within these th uh, four species, we have a strong variation in Oligonia morphology. And size indeed, if size matters to you, well, PTA on average has the larger old spore. And so in summary, combining all the data, we've got good support that PTA, as Ross predicted, is a new species to science. And this is based on sequence data, morphology, and pathology, host range. We propose Phytophthora agathodicida in ED as the agathus killing Phytophthora, which was PTA. We also propose Phytophthora cocos in ED, the coconut associate, associated Phytophthora, but other less rugose entity. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we've been use, we use uh, PCR, or we use DNA-based technologies to help in our identification. And indeed, there is a, uh, a barcode now, which has been adopted almost universally to help us standardise how we look at and discriminate between Phytophthora species. And these work really well for pure cultures because Get nothing sort of inhibiting or confusing or trying or confusing the machinery. You know, not that I'm saying machinery is is simple, uh, but but fundamentally, if you put in bad bad stuff, you're going to get bad stuff out the other end. So, and that is really challenging, especially when you're looking at soil, because when you're looking at soil, it's full of all sorts of things. Um, Woodgard mentioned that some of uh, some of the uh, organics. Organic breakdown byproducts, the tannins, the resins, these things are really, when it comes to chemical reactions, they've got their own biochemistry and they really don't lend themselves very nicely. So in order to move beyond conventional PCR, we have to actually look towards some other technologies and this technology is called real-time PCR. And real-time PCR is a, a more targeted form of uh, sequencing which we basically have to identify a primer that is unique to, P, uh, to PTA. And as this graph shows, we can use it to uh, for the detection of pure genomic uh, DNA, but also we can also detect PTA in the presence of soil. But as this graph shows, when you add soil, when you're looking for PTA in the presence of soil, the level of detection reduces. And that's basically because these the soil itself lends a level of complexity which confounds the specificity of the assay. But we have been able to recognise PTA in the presence of soil down to uh, about two, uh, 20 femtograms. But what this, uh, what this provides is an opportunity to, revive, to refine our, uh, our traditional assay. So instead of basically taking soil baits off, we could basically take soil baits directly to a PCR reaction. And in this way, try to increase the, the speed of our, of our diagnosis. So just in conclusion, um, we'd like to wrap up by saying Phytophthora uh, agathodicida in ED is an exotic soil-borne root and colorite pathogen of Caldi. PTA can be detected from soil via an indirect soil bioassay. The old spores of PTA have been shown to be formed experimentally in the roots of infected kauri plants, and that infected roots of kauri can transfer PTA infection to other roots of kauri. We'd like to confirm that PTA is a new species to science, 
and, potent and potentially the integration of DNA-based diagnostics could improve the efficiency and the speed of our detection. Keep Karen standing. Thank you.